Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up for this week ending June 28, 2024. I'm Neil Bisson, a retired intelligence officer with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and the director of Global Intelligence Knowledge Network, and your host for this week's Global Intelligence Wrap-Up. Each week, I dive into the latest headlines, providing insights into national security, foreign interference, espionage, and terrorism, as well as all things spy-related. Before we get into today's episode, I want to highlight the importance of your support in keeping this podcast going. If you enjoy the content, please visit www.globalintelligenceknowledgenetwork.com where you'll find a wealth of information, including articles, blogs, media appearances, and dossiers on various intelligence agencies. There is also a YouTube channel, Inside Intelligence Kickin', offering videos on a range of intelligence topics, from cryptocurrency and terrorism to situational awareness, and our multi-part series, Killer Spies, The Dark Side of Intelligence. Be sure to subscribe and stay updated. Additionally, I co-host another podcast called Spies Like Us, with fellow retired CSIS intelligence professionals Al Trudenik and Phil Gursky. We discuss current intelligence topics, both within Canada and globally. It's a fascinating listen, and I highly recommend you check it out. Make sure to subscribe to Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or simply ask your smart speaker to play it. If you enjoy the content, please leave a comment, give us a ranking, and share it with others. Your feedback and support are crucial in helping us continue to provide high quality and insightful content. You can also support the show by becoming a supporter at buzzbrot.com forward slash 233-6717 forward slash support. Contributions are greatly appreciated and help ensure we can continue bringing you these important insights. All the links to the mentioned platforms and resources are included in the text of this podcast. Thank you for your support. Now let's dive into this week's episode of Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. In this first story, we start by diving into a highly pertinent topic, the caution urged by RCMP Commissioner Mike Duham on naming alleged foreign state colluders within the Canadian Parliament. This discussion stems from a recent article titled RCMP Commissioner Urges Caution on Naming Alleged Foreign State Colluders. The head of Canada's National Police Force has entered a deepening political debate about whether to name parliamentarians who are allegedly assisting foreign governments. Opposition MPs have been pushing for transparency on this matter. However, RCMP Commissioner Mike Dehem has urged caution, warning that revealing these identities could have unintended consequences. Hem's concern is primarily about the reliability of single source reporting. He pointed out that sometimes information comes from a single source, which may not always be reliable. This is significant from an intelligence perspective because it because the release of unverified names could jeopardize lives and ongoing investigations. Earlier this month, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, or NCCOP, released a report alleging that federal politicians are wittingly or semi-wittingly colluding with foreign states. NDP MP Jenny Kwong is among those calling for the identities to be revealed, arguing that keeping them secret damages the reputation of all members of the House of Commons and erodes public trust in elected officials. This issue is not just about naming names. It taps into broader concerns about foreign interference and the integrity of national institutions. The debate highlights the delicate balance between transparency and security. Comparing this to similar events, such as past allegations of foreign interference in elections, we see a consistent theme, the challenge of addressing potential threats without compromising intelligence methods or international partnerships. In the article, Dehem emphasized the risk of compromising investigations and the importance of protecting the tradecraft involved in intelligence work. He also mentioned the impact of international partners supplying some of that information. From my professional experience, I can attest to the critical need for careful handling of sensitive information to maintain both national and international security. Furthermore, the Liberal government cites the Official Secret Act as a reason for not naming individuals, arguing that doing so would break the law. This perspective underscores the legal and ethical complexities in dealing with such sensitive information. However, it also provides a escape clause for any MP, national security or intelligence officer who reads the unredacted documents. To summarize, while the call for transparency is understandable, the potential risk of naming parliamentarians based on single source reporting cannot be ignored. This does not excuse the government from taking needed action to investigate, arrest and prosecute individuals who are proven to have engaged or are engaging in foreign interference. Let's be honest here. This is straight up treason and a message needs to be sent 
to the MPs engaging in this activity and the foreign state nations benefiting from their treasonous actions. It is essential to balance the public's right to know with the imperative to protect national security and the integrity of ongoing investigations. Looking ahead, with BC70 now being passed, we will have more tools to counter foreign interference by creating a foreign agent registry and expanding intelligence gathering powers, making a significant step forward. In our next story, we focus on a significant cybersecurity report revealing intensified attacks on Taiwanese organizations by a suspected Chinese back hacking group, Red Juliet. According to a US-based cybersecurity firm, this group compromised two dozen organizations between November 2023 and April 2024, likely in support of Beijing's intelligence gathering activities on Taiwan. Red Juliet exploited vulnerabilities in internet-facing applications such as firewalls, VPNs, target-rich tech firms, government agencies, and universities. They conducted network reconnaissance and attempted exploitation against more than 70 Taiwanese organizations, including de facto embassies, technology industries, and critical technology fields. This escalation in cyber attacks highlights the persistent and growing threat of cyber espionage, particularly from state-sponsored groups. China claims Taiwan as part of its territory and has a vested interest in its diplomatic relations with and technological advancements. This situation is reminiscent of previous instances where cyber espionage has been employed to gain strategic advantages. Recorded Future, the cybersecurity firm, expects China state-sponsored hackers to continue targeting Taiwan for intelligence gathering. They anticipate a continued focus on conducting reconnaissance and exploiting facing devices, a tactic that has proved successful against a wide range of global targets. Yet again, this underscores the need for robust cybersecurity measures and international cooperation to counter such threats. Any successes by a group like Red Juliet simply emboldens the Chinese government to use these same tactics as other targets in the West. To sum up, the report on Red Juliet's intensified cyber attacks against Taiwanese organizations underscores the ongoing and evolving nature of cyber espionage. It is crucial for nations to stay vigilant and invest in cybersecurity to protect their critical infrastructure and national security interests. As this story develops, I'll keep a close eye on the implications and the potential responses from Taiwan, Canada, and our allies. Our next story brings us to a complex and political charge topic. Six assassinations are the US and Canada raising the heat on India. A year after the assassination of six separatist leader Hardy Singh Nijar, ongoing court cases in Canada and the United States are focusing on alleged Indian overseas murder plots, testing New Delhi's ties with both Ottawa and Washington. This news article explores the significant developments in the assassination of Hardy Singh Nijar, a proponent of the Khalistan movement, who was killed outside the community shrine near Vancouver. This incident has led diplomatic and legal measures in Canada and the U.S., putting India under intense scrutiny. In Canada, a hearing on June 25th provided prosecutors another opportunity to present evidence linking India to Nijar's murder. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the extradition of Nikhil Gupta from the Czech Republic has highlighted another plot against a Sikh separatist leader, Kirpatwant Singh Panun. From an intelligence perspective, these developments are not just an isolated incident, but part of a broader pattern of alleged state-sponsored extradition territorial executions operations by India to suppress separatist movements. The significance lies in the impact these operations have on international relations, particularly with Western countries that house significant Sikh diasporas. Nizar's assassination and the subsequent court cases must be viewed in the context of the long-standing Khalistan movement, which seeks to establish a separate Sikh state in India's Punjab region. This movement though dismissed by India, has seen a resurgence among the diaspora. Relations between India and Canada have been strained since Canada Prime Minister Justin Trudeau suggested Indian government involvement in Nijar's murder. This accusation led to diplomatic standoff, including withdrawal of Indian diplomats and the suspension of visas for Canadians. Similarly, in the U.S., the case against Nikhil Gupta underscores the global dimensions of these operations. Gupta was accused of conspiring to assassinate Panun, another Sikh separatist leader, under the direction of a research and analysis wing, or RAW, intelligence officer identified as Vikram Yadav. Experts have noted that such extraterritorial operations are indicative of a broader strategy by states to counter perceived threats beyond their borders. 
These actions are part of a sophisticated strategy to manage internal dissent and exter external influence. The implications for national security are profound, as they challenge both Canadian and American sovereignty and our ability to protect residents and citizens from deadly foreign state actions. To summarize, the cases involving the assassinations of Sikh separatist leaders like Niger and the plots against Panoon reveal a complex web of international intrigue and state-sponsored assassination. These actions have significant implications for diplomatic relations and international law enforcement collaboration. Looking ahead, we can expect these cases to continue to shape the geopolitical land, especially in terms of how countries address the presence of activities of foreign state actors within their borders. In the next story, we're examining the tragic and alarming series of terrorist attacks in the Russian Dagestan region from the article entitled Terror Attack on Synagogue, Churches, and Russians Dagestan, What We Know by Al Jazeera. The article highlights the recent violence that resulted in the deaths of policemen and civilians, marking a significant escalation in regional security concerns. This article delves into the coordinated attacks that took place in Dagestan on Sunday. Armed men attacked a synagogue, an Orthodox church, a police post, all resulting in the deaths of 19 people, including 15 police officers and four civilians. From an intelligence perspective, these attacks are significant for several reasons. First, they represent a direct challenge to Russian state authority and a region already fraught with historical and ethnic tensions. The choice of targets, religious institutions, and law enforcement suggests a calculated effort to incite fear and division within the community. Dagestan is in the North Caucasus region along the Caspian Sea and has predominantly Muslim population. It is home to over 50 ethnicities, earning the nickname the Mountain of Languages. The region's historical context is crucial to understand the current security situation. Dagestan borders Chechnya, another North Caucasian Republic with a history of separatist conflict, which has occasionally spilled over into Dagestan. The attacks in Dagestan are reminiscent of a wider pattern of violence in the Northern Caucasus, often linked to separatist and extremist groups. The recent history of terrorist activity, including a large-scale attack on a concert in Moscow claimed by the Islamic State Khorasan Province, or ISIS-K, further underscores the persistent threat of terrorism in Russia. Al Jazeera's coverage includes insights from Domantila Sargamoso, a lecturer in security and development in College at King College, London. She suggests a probable connection between the attackers and ISIS, given the nature of the targets, Orthodox churches and synagogues. From my professional analysis, the coordinated nature of these attacks and the selection of high-profile targets aligns with tactics commonly employed by ISIS and similar extremist groups. This connection, if confirmed, would indicate a troubling expansion of ISIS activities within Russia, particularly in the Northern Caucasus region. To summarize, the attacks in Dagestan represent a significant escalation in regional violence and underscored the ongoing threat of terrorism in the North Caucasus. Well, the implications for national security are profound, particularly in terms of maintaining regional stability and preventing further extremist violence. Looking forward, it's crucial for Russian authorities to address both the immediate security threats and the underlying social political issues that contribute to such acts of violence. Enhanced counterterrorism measures and community engagement will, will be vital in preventing future attacks and maintaining stability. In this next story, we shift gears to what India believes is a threat that hasn't stopped and is growing in Canada. In the next story, we examine a poignant and politically charged issue highlighted in the article, No Government Should Overlook the Threat of Terrorism Emanating from Its Territories for Political Gain, the Indian envoy says to Canada. This article discusses India's call to action against terrorism on the 39th anniversary of the 1985 Air India bombing, an event that claimed 329 lives most of whom were Canadians of Indian descent. I'll analyze the Indian envoy's strong statement emphasizing that no government should ignore terrorism emanating from its territories for political gains. This statement comes amid rising tensions between Canada and India over issues related to terrorism and the glorification of militancy. The Kanishka bombing of 1985, where Air India Flight 182 was destroyed by a bomb mid-flight, serves as a grim reminder of the catastrophic impact of terrorism. The bombing, attributed to Sikh militants, resulted in the loss of 329 lives, making it as the worst aviation disaster in Canadian history. The Indian High Commission in Canada commemorated the 39th anniversary of this tragic event, underscoring the need for global cooperation against terrorism. High Commissioner Sanjay Kumar Burma's remarks stressed that 
Human lives should never be compromised for political gains. He called for robust legal and social action to combat terrorism, urging governments, security agencies, and international organizations to work together to dismantle terrorist networks and counter their ideology. This strong stance by India comes at a time of strained relations with Canada, particularly after Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau alleged allegations regarding the involvement of Indian agents in the killing of Nijar. India has rejected these claims as baseless and motivated, highlighting ongoing diplomatic tensions. From an intelligence perspective, the statement by the Indian envoy reflects a broader concern about the politicization of terrorism. Allowing terrorism to fester for political gains undermines international security efforts and sets a dangerous precedent. The emphasis on collective action to counter terrorism aligns with global counterterrorism strategies, which advocate for international cooperation and stringent measures to disrupt terrorist activities. However, the actions of Sikh terrorists almost 40 years ago does not justify the extrajudicial executions operations against Canadian citizens like Nijar. India's objections to Canada Parliament's recent observance of a moment of silence for Nijar, as well as the protest actions outside of the Indian consulate in Vancouver, further exemplifies the friction between the two countries over the handling of terrorism-related issues. The condemnation of the Kanishka bombings serves as a reminder of the devastating consequences of terrorism and the ongoing need for international vigilance and cooperation. We now focus our attention on a story that has nominated the news this week by starting with an article entitled WikiLinks, Julian Assange said to be freed after a US plea deal from Global News. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLinks, is, has pled guilty to violating US espionage law. The plea deal concludes a 14 year long legal battle that allowed Assange to return to his home country, Australia. Assange agreed to plead guilty to conspiring to obtain and disclose classified US national defense documents. This development marks the end of an era that saw Assange spend over five years in a British high security jail and seven years in Ecuadorian embassy in London. From an intelligence perspective, this case has been a focal point in the discourse on the balance between national security and freedom of the press. The US government has viewed Assange as a threat, accusing him of endangering lives through the mass release of classified documentation. On the other hand, many see Assange as a hero for transparency and exposing government misconduct. WikiLeaks came to prominence in 2010 after releasing hundreds of thousands of classified U.S. military documents related to wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. One of the most notorious releases was a 2007 video showing a U.S. Apache helicopter attacking and killing suspected insurgents in Iraq, including two Reuters journalists. This incident highlights the complex and often controversial nature of intelligence operation and the dissemination of classified information. Assange's legal troubles began in 2010 when he was arrested in Britain on a European arrest warrant over sex crime allegations in Sweden, which were later dropped. To avoid extradition to Sweden, he sought asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he remained until 2019. His time there marked the ongoing legal battles and significant public interest. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has criticized the plea deal, stating that Assange's actions endangered lies and that he should have been prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. This perspective underscores the ongoing debate about the consequences of leaking classified information. In contrast, press freedom advocates argue that Assange's prosecution set a dangerous precedent for journalists and whistleblowers. Alan Rusbrigger, a former editor of The Guardian, expressed concern over the use of espionage laws against those who reveal uncomfortable truth. Stella Assange, Julian's wife, has voiced her worry about the guilty plea under the Espionage Act and the implications for journalists. From my perspective, Assange's decision to release national security and military documents and videos without fully appreciating the consequences of their release was a lack of responsibility in journalism. He equated national security issues to less than that of celebrity gossip photos and simply wanted attention for his actions. However, recent national security leaks in Canada have demonstrated issues like foreign interference are needed to be published to garner the necessary attention of citizens and MPs. In summary, Julian Assange's plea and impending release mark a significant moment in the interaction of national security and press freedom. This case has highlighted the challenges of ethical dilemmas inherent in handling classified information and the role of journalists and whistleblowers. As we move forward, it's essential to stay informed and vigilant about the evolving landscape of global intelligence and its impact to our freedoms. In the next section, we're examining critical development in Indo-Pacific region that has significant implications for global security. Our main topic is an article entitled, Should Russia's Outreach in Indo-Pacific Be a Wake-Up Call for Canada? 
from Global News. Russia's recent efforts to strengthen ties with allies in the Indo-Pacific, particularly North Korea and Vietnam, should indeed serve as a wake-up call for, Can for Canada and the Western nations. Russian President Vladimir Putin's recent tour of North Korea and Vietnam, which included signing multiple agreements and a mutual defense pact with North Korea, highlights a strategic shift that could alter the balance of power in the region. From an intelligence perspective, these developments underscore Russia's intent to assert its influence beyond Europe and into the Indo-Pacific. This move is particularly significant as it challenges the notion that China is the sole great power threat in the region. The United States has already expressed concern over the outreach, emphasizing the need to strengthen alliances with other countries like Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam. Russia's involvement in the Indo-Pacific is not a recent development. Since at least 2014, Putin has sought to expand Russia's economic and military footprint in Asia and counter the Western sanctions and geopolitical pressures. Russia's military's presence in the region, collaboration with China, and the engagement in the Arctic are all part of a broader strategy to extend its influence. This outreach has significant implications for Canada, which has been focusing on the Indo-Pacific strategy to counter China's growing influence. The recent agreements between Russia and North Korea, as well as Russia's deepening ties with Vietnam, present new challenges that Canada must address in strategic planning. Balkan Devlin, a senior fellow at the Macdonald Laurie Institute, warns that Canada must recognize the threat posed by Russia in the Indo-Pacific. He suggests learning from Japanese and South Korean allies about the connectivity and the threat that Russia poses. Vina Najib Dubula, Vice President of Research and Strategy at the Asian Pacific Foundation of Canada, echoes this sentiment, emphasizing that Canada has a stake in the region, particularly through its military role in monitoring UN sanctions on North Korea. Jeff Ruiz, a senior Washington fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, points out that Russia's outreach in Asia has been ongoing for the past 15 years. This long-term strategy should not come as a surprise, but rather as a call to revisit and possibly revise existing assumptions and strategies. In summary, Russia's increasing engagement in the Indo-Pacific region signals a need for Canada and its allies to reassess their strategies and recognize the multifaceted nature of the threats in the region. As global power dynamics continue to evolve, it is crucial that Canada stay vigilant and adaptive in its approach to maintaining regional stability and security. From an intelligence perspective, this means that newly formed or more intense ties between Russia and Indo-Pacific countries means that a sharing of intelligence on the U.S., Canada, and our allies will become a priority for these current and possibly future enemy foreign states. Intelligence collaboration between Russia, North Korea, Vietnam, and other countries in that region equate to a force multiplier for any espionage, sabotage, foreign interference, or other national security threat against North America, Europe, and Australian allies. A comprehensive and strategic countermeasure discussion needs to be taking place along with all of our Five Eye partners on how to approach and potentially dismantle this new threat from the newly minted Russian allies. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. Before I go, I'd like to wish all of our Canadian listeners a happy Canada Day weekend and all those listeners in the United States, happy 4th of July. For those of you who are interested, here are some ways you can stay connected and support the podcast and Global Intelligence Knowledge Network. First, visit our website, of course, at www.globalintelligenceknowledgenetwork.com for a wealth of resources including insights, terminology, media appearances, and detailed dossiers on intelligence agencies. Dive into our extensive collection of articles and blogs that explore the intriguing world of intelligence. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, Inside Intelligence Geekin at Inside Intelligence Kicking, We cover a wide range of topics like cryptocurrency and terrorism, situational awareness, ghouling, and our latest series, Killer Spies, The Dark Side of Intelligence. There's plenty of content waiting for you. I also co-host another podcast, Spies Like Us, with retired intelligence professionals, Alfred Denick and Phil Gursky. We delve into current issues and intelligence landscape, both in Canada and globally. It's a fascinating listen, and I highly recommend it. Be sure to subscribe to Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play it. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a comment and share your thoughts. Lastly, if you'd like to support the show and help to continue delivering this content, consider becoming a supporter at buzzsprout.com forward slash 233-6717 forward slash support. Your contributions make a significant difference and help keep the information flowing. Thanks for joining me this week. Stay curious, stay informed, and stay safe. See you next time on Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up.